I guess we can go ahead and get started. Um, so this is our last uh, seminar for the fall semester of 2022, which is just crazy. Um, and I think probably the almost the best attended, if not the best attended. So that's really great. Um, so we had Jamila Roth here today to do an, uh, a presentation and her advisor to do an introduction for her, please. Thank you. Um, it is my honor to introduce Jamila Roth. Um, Jamila comes to UF after doing a, um, a bachelor's degree at Skidmore College. Um, and she was actually the first student hired in my lab at UF, um, which comes with all kinds of extra hurdles. Um, she comes into a lab that almost no people and very little stuff. Um, so she had to design mesocosm experiments, but also design the mesocosms. So she was the first person to use mesocosms at NCPF. She used some mesocosms at Whitney Lab that ha probably hadn't been used in a decade. Um, so she had to learn some plumbing skills. And there were some other hurdles she had to figure out. Um, she wanted to do some cool um, secondary metabolite work, but I didn't have protocols or, or the equipment. So she had to find um, them with that stuff. In addition to the hurdles associated with a new lab, the whole second half of her, her PhD occurred during a global pandemic. And we know how, um, how many extra hurdles that added. But um, she's finished on time and um, done a remarkable job. She's very resilient. Um, and she's done all of the things that we hope PhD students will do. Um, she's won awards from all over, from the department, the, the um, Wetland Bi Biogeochemistry Lab Award, from the university, from the Nature Coast Biological Station, from the state, from Florida Sea Grant. Um, and even been recognized by international, our international societies, the Crystal Mystery Research Federation. She's already published one chapter from her dissertation, two are in review, and I hope a, another one will be in review in the next, next couple of weeks. Um, and in addition to all those research things, she's been really active in education and outreach. Um, she's received independent funding from the Thompson Center for her Education and Outreach. Um, she has a peer-reviewed publication based on her education and outreach, and there are thousands of students in the panhandle who are using her protocol and her samples, um, and that's that's really remarkable. It's kind of an above and beyond for a lot of a lot of um, dissertation projects. After all those accolades, it's probably not a surprise to you that she has something else lined up. Um, she finished her her dissertation and defended a few weeks ago with. Um, passed with flying colors, and she has signed on to do a postdoc at Moat Marine Lab starting next year. So um, thankfully, um, that's not too far physically or intellectually from our lab group. Um, she's definitely a leader in this group, and we, we are hoping that we will continue to collaborate with her. So I'm going to turn it over to Jamila to talk about what she's been working on for the last um, five years, but I also want to thank all of you in the room and all of you on Zoom um, for being here to celebrate all that she's accomplished as well. Thanks, Well, um, thank you all for joining and thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, so today I'll be talking about my dissertation research focused on the effects of environmental change and species richness on seagrass resilience and seagrass herbivore interactions. Um, and so there are multiple co-occurring stressors impacting coastal ecosystems, and these include changing nutrient concentrations, as well as changes in sea surface temperature due to climate change. And then the sea surface temperature impacts the physiology of the plants and animals living in the ocean, but it also impacts food web dynamics. Um, with changing temperatures comes um, range expansion of tropical species with tropical species expanding into subtropical and temperate regions, um, altering trophic interactions. And so understanding the impact of co-occurring stressors on these co coastal um, ecosystems requires an understanding of interactions among multiple co-occurring stressors, as well as an in, uh, understanding of the factors influencing ecosystem resistance and resilience. And so seagrasses can serve as an ideal model system for studying the impact of multiple stressors and resilience. Since there's already a baseline understanding of the impacts of single stressors, 
And seagrasses have also served as a model system for understanding the impacts of genetic diversity on ecosystem stability and functions. Seagrasses are also extremely valuable systems. So they provide many ecosystem services, including carbon sequestration and nutrient cycling. Um, specifically, seagrasses serve as a hotspot for denitrification, which removes excess nitrogen from coastal environments. Um, they can also purify the water by trapping organic matter and nutrients, um, and they can protect coastal communities from um, storms. Uh, and unfortunately, there's high rates of seagrass loss. So it's estimated that seagrasses are declining by around 7% every year, which puts them among the most threatened ecosystems. And so we need to work to manage and restore these um, valuable ecosystems. And in order to do this, we need to incorporate positive interactions and mechanisms that boost resilience. Seagrasses in the northern Gulf of Mexico are experiencing increases in the abundance of manatees, green turtles, and emerald parrotfish as a result of both tropicalization and conservation. And so these are seagrass herbivores, and it's expected to cause a shift from a detritus-based ecosystem to an ecosystem based on the direct consumption of seagrasses. Um, in this region, there's also multiple co-occurring uh, seagrass species, which makes it an ideal location to study the impact of seagrass species richness on ecosystem function and resilience. Um, and in order to manage and restore these really valuable yet threatened ecosystems, we need engaged and informed citizens. And researchers have found that environmental education can increase civic engagement, increase environmentally responsible behaviors and improve academic, emotional and social skills in students. And lessons on seagrass ecosystems can also help students engage with concepts that are directly related to both Florida learning standards and national learning standards. So today I will talk about five different projects and first we'll discuss how different stressors would impact seagrass herbivore interactions. And then we'll transition to talk about how seagrass species richness impacts ecosystem functions and stability. And then finally, I'll discuss a project where I use seagrass focused activities in elementary school science clubs. Um, so first we'll focus on how warming temperatures and grazing by multiple herbivores impact seagrass herbivore interactions. And so, like I said, tropicalization is occurring in many regions globally. Um, and this includes areas in Japan, Australia, and the Mediterranean, where increases in tropical herbivores have resulted in the loss of foundation species, which in these cases are macroalgae. And so it's caused a phase shift from a macroalgal dominated system to a barren system. And so uh, in the Northern Gulf of Mexico, there are increases in tropical herbivores, but we're unsure how this increase in herbivory will impact the foundation species, which is seagrasses. Um, and so I'm interested in investigating how increases in tropical herbivores might impact these valuable seagrass meadows. And so the impact of plant herbivore or the, the influence, the impact of increasing um, herbivores will depend on both anti-herbivore defenses in the plants as well as the herbivore feeding decisions. And so plant anti-herbivore defenses has two components. It includes the plant tolerance traits, which reduce the impact of herbivory on plant fitness. And these can include um, non-structural carbohydrate reserves, compensatory growth, and plant structure traits. Um, and then there's also plant resistance traits, which influence the taste and texture of the plants. So these can include both chemical and physical anti-herbivore defenses. And so to better understand how warming temperatures and grazing by various herbivores would impact seagrass meadows, I conducted a mesocosm experiment. And so I collected uh, Thalassia testudinum, uh, which is turtle grass from Steenhatchee, Florida, and planted it in a mesocosm where I allowed it to acclimate for three weeks. And then I began the experiment by applying a temperature treatment. Um, and two weeks later, I applied five different grazing treatments. And then at the end of the four and a half week experiment, I broke down the experiment and conducted feeding choice trials using the seagrass grown in the mesocosms. And so here's a little bit more detail on the temperature treatments. Um, this experiment was conducted in the summer in Florida. So the ambient temperature was already pretty warm and it was averaging around 31 degrees Celsius. And then I also created a warmer treatment using aquarium heaters and increased the temperature by around three degrees Celsius to get an average of 34 degrees Celsius. 
And so while these are really warm temperatures, I've collected um, temperature data from a seagrass meadow in Cedar Key, Florida. Um, and so here on the x-axis, you can see the date in August. And then on the y-axis on the left is the temperature. And so that's shown in black. Um, and it's the water temperature. And then in gray is the water level based on the tides. And so the dashed lines show the ambient and heated treatment. And it's just the average temperature in those treatments. And so you can see that the temperature in the seagrass meadows is already reaching or exceeding these temperatures. So it's pretty, it might be more realistic than you would think for current and predicted temperatures in the seagrass meadows. Um, and then I applied five different grazing treatments. So not pictured as the control, which I did not manipulate. And then I um, simulated green turtle grazing where I used scissors to clip the seagrass to nine centimeters. And then I also simulated parrotfish grazing where I used a hole punch to make a half moon shaped scar similar to a parrotfish bite. And so this was simulating the grazing pattern of two different tropical grazers that are expanding into the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, and then I also added live herbivores for a total of 24 hours to the pot. So I added live sea urchins and live amphipods. And it's important to note that I did not observe any grazing scars from the amphipods. So I treated this more as a control as well. And so first I'll discuss how these um, grazing and temperature treatments impact, impact plant tolerance traits. And this is really important because changes in seagrass structure and cover can impact habitat provisioning, carbon sequestration and sediment stabilization. And as a foundation species, changes in seagrass structure and cover can also cascade throughout the entire ecosystem and interconnected ecosystems. So I'll have a series of graphs that are set up like this with the grazing treatment on the x-axis and the response variable on the y-axis. And so here we're looking at the growth rate. Um, and then in blue is the ambient temperature and in orange is the warmer temperature. So we found that under warming temperatures, the seagrasses exhibited reduced productivity. And so this is what we expected since research has found that this species has a thermal threshold of 33 degrees Celsius. Um, however, we found that the grazing treatment did not impact the growth rate. And so this means that the plants are exhibiting compensatory growth uh, since they're um, the grazed plants have less photosynthetic tissue, but they're still maintaining comparable growth rates. So they're relatively, or they're able to recover from this disturbance. And then I also measured canopy height, density, and number of leaves per plant. And we found that under warmer temperatures, the plants had reduced canopy height, reduced density, and reduced number of leaves per plant. And the grazing treatment also reduced the canopy height and um, the grazing and temperature treatment interactively impacted the number of leaves per plant, which means that the impact of different herbivore species might vary based on the temperature that the plants experience. And then finally, I measured rhizome non-structural carbohydrates. So um, shown on the y-axis is the concentration of these carbohydrates. And so seagrasses can store carbohydrates in the roots and then mobilize these um, in order to recover from disturbances. And so it's a form of, our, or it can increase uh, plant resilience. And so we found that the plants that received the simulated turtle grazing had reduced concentrations of non-structural carbohydrates compared to the plants that um, experienced the amphipod treatment. And so this indicates that the turtle grazed plants might be re less resilient to future disturbances. And so now I'll discuss how these stressors impact seagrass resistance traits. Um, and these are important because they can influence herbivore feeding behavior. So here we have the leaf tissue nutrient ratios, um, the carbon to phosphorus ratio and the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so a lower ratio means that there's actually higher concentrations of phosphorus or nitrogen, which would make the plants more desirable for herbivores. Um, and so we found that the turtle grazed plants had reduced carbon to phosphorus ratios, indicating that these plants might be more palatable and more nutritious for herbivores, whereas the other grazing treatments did not impact the carbon to phosphorus ratio. And then the um, turtle grazed, parrotfish grazed, and the urchin grazed plants had reduced carbon to nitrogen ratios, indicating that they would also likely be more desirable for herbivores. And then there's a borderline significant impact of the temperature treatment with warmer temperatures, plants that experienced warmer temperatures having uh, reduced carbon to nitrogen ratios as well, indicating that these might also be more palatable and nutritious for the 
herbivores. And we also measure the toughness of young leaves using a leaf penetrometer. So this is basically the weight in grams that is required to puncture a leaf. Uh, and we found that the, under warmer temperatures, the young leaves were um, less tough. And so they might be easier to bite through for smaller herbivores, especially. And so now I'll talk about how these plant responses influence herbivore feeding behavior. And since this is influenced by plant physical and chemical characteristics and grazing pressure impacts these same physical and chemical characteristics, there can be feedbacks between plant, uh, plant traits and herbivore feeding behavior. And so we found that the sea urchin Linochinus variegatus preferred the seagrass that was grown under warmer temperatures. And this is what we expected based on the changes in plant traits. However, we're not sure what this, um, what specific traits are driving this preference. So it could either be due to structure or chemistry, since there is both decreased leaf toughness in these young leaves that were used in the feeding trial, and there's also decreased leaf tissue carbon to nitrogen ratio, which means the leaves contain relatively more nitrogen. It's also important to note that we did not measure the secondary metabolites, so these could also be changing and driving herbivore feeding decisions. Um, and these changes in plant tissue nutrients and um, the different stressors can drive feedback cycles. So um, grazing pressure can result in increased nutrient concentrations, which would make the plants more desirable for, graze, for herbivores and increase the grazing pressure. Um, warming temperatures can also um, serve as an external stressor that further increases plant tissue nutrient concentrations and grazing pressure, as we found. And then on a larger scale, warming temperatures can result in its own feedback loop, where warming results in increased grazing, which results in loss of biomass and loss of or reduced carbon sequestration. And then in the grand scheme, there would be um, more warming or faster rate of warming due to increased carbon dioxide. Um, and then this would create its own feedback cycle, further increasing grazing pressure and seagrass nutrient concentrations. And so both warming temperatures and grazing by various herbivores uh, resulted in increased leaf tissue nutrient concentration. So these uh, stressors could additive, additively increase nutrient concentrations in the seagrasses. And so overall, we found a complex response to warming and tropicalization. Um, warming impacted both tolerance and resistance traits, while the plants were tolerant of the grazing, which can be, which um, is demonstrated by their compensatory growth following the grazing. Um, we also found that grazer identity mattered. So only the simulated turtle grazing resulted in reduced carbohydrate storage and reduced carbon to phosphorus. Um, so these plant herbivore interactions will likely be changing as the herbivore community changes with tropicalization. And both of these stressors could lead to feedback loops and increased palatability. And so now I'll discuss how phosphorus availability impacts seagrass herbivore interactions. So like I said earlier, um, there are changes in nutrient availability in coastal systems due to land use changes, and mainly through urbanization and agricultural intensification. Along the Gulf Coast of Florida, there's a gradient in phosphorus availability that's maintained by Miocene phosphate deposits. And um, this gradient has been studied with researchers finding that seagrass structure and cover varies along the gradient. So at low total phosphorus sites, the seagrass is more dense but smaller, where at sites with high total phosphorus, the seagrass is larger uh, but less dense. And uh, researchers, researchers have also suggested that this could lead to potential differences in habitat provisioning, particle trapping, and carbon sequestration. So I wanted to use this natural gradient in phosphorus availability to test the resource availability hypothesis and examine how plant herbivore interactions vary along the gradient. Um, and so this hypothesis predicts that in phosphorus rich environments, there would be lower investment in anti herbivore defenses since the plants could quickly regrow and recover following disturbances. While in resource poor or phosphorus poor environments, the plants would invest more in anti herbivore defenses due to higher re uh, regrowth costs. And so I asked how total phosphorus concentration impacts physical and chemical defenses in Thalassia testudinum or turtle grass. And I also wanted to better understand how total phosphorus impacts foraging decisions by various herbivores. 
And so I used three different sites along the phosphorus gradient um, on the Gulf Coast of Florida to um, answer these questions. So I included a uh, Wikiwachi, which is at the southern end of the gradient and has low total phosphorus. And then I also used plants from Crystal River and Homosassa, which are at the northern end of, end of the gradient, and they both have higher total phosphorus. Um, and I measured both physical and chemical anti herbivore defenses. So for the physical defenses, I measured both specific leaf area and the uh, percent of fiber in the leaves. And so here on the x axis, I have the collection site. Um, and so just a reminder, Wikiwachi has low total phosphorus, where, where, while Crystal River and Homosassa both have high total phosphorus. Then I have the response variable on the y axis. So specific leaf area is the um, surface area, area per dry weight. So it basically says how tough or thick the seagrass leaves. So we would expect that um, leaves with a low um, specific leaf area would be tougher and less desirable for herbivores. And we found that plants from Wikiwachi, which has low total phosphorus, had, had lower specific leaf area than the plants from Crystal River or Homo Sassa, indicating that these leaves are tougher and less desirable for herbivores. Uh, we also found that the plants from Wikiwachi had higher fiber than the plants from Homo Sassa. So overall, um, the plants from Wikiwachi had stronger physical defenses. Um, and then we measured secondary metabolites. So the first five panels here on the right are different um, phenolic acids. And then I also measured condensed tannins. And we found that the plants from Wikiwachi had the highest concentration of gallic acid, vanillic acid, ferulic acid, and condensed tannins. So overall, these plants from Wikiwachi had stronger physical and chemical anti-herbivore defenses. And then we measured herbivore feeding preference for the plants from the three different locations. And we conducted feeding choice trials with both sea urchins and the emerald parrotfish, uh, which is one of the tropicalizing herbivores. And we conducted the uh, feeding choice trials using both fresh seagrass leaves as well as seagrass that was dried and ground and then embedded in agar. And so the purpose of these agar-based leaves is that um, these artificial seagrass leaves um, control for the impact of leaf structure. And so we expect that feeding decisions for the agar-based leaves would be driven solely by um, leaf chemistry. And we found that the sea urchins in general preferred the um, seagrass from Crystal River and Homosassa over that from Wikiwachi for both the fresh and agar-based leaves. Um, in these graphs, you can see the location on the x-axis and then the amount consumed on the y-axis. And then we found that the emerald parrotfish were a little pickier. So they preferred the seagrass from Homosassa over the seagrass from the other two locations. Um, in general, for both herbivore species, the results from the uh, trials with fresh seagrass matched the results from the trials with agar-based seagrass, indicating that their preferences were mainly driven by leaf chemistry. Um, well, and then uh, leaf structure could be secondarily impacting the decisions. Um, and then we also found that the parrotfish were pickier than the sea urchins as they preferred only the seagrass from one location. So overall, these results support the resource availability hypothesis where the plants from the phosphorus poor location had higher anti-herbivore defenses and they were avoided by the herbivores. Um, and then uh, previous research by Dr. Berry has also found that plants from the phosphorus poor location also had slower growth rates. So this is consistent with my findings since these plants would um, struggle to recover from herbivory. We also found that the plant physical and chemical defenses co-varied. So when physical defenses were higher, the chemical defenses were also higher and we did not observe any trade-offs. And finally, we found that the two different herbivore species exhibited different feeding preferences. So this might spread grazing pressure among multiple locations along the phosphorus gradient. So now I'll transition to discuss how macrophyte species richness and influences resilience to disturbances. So like I said earlier, genetic diversity has been extensively researched in seagrass and researchers have found that genetic diversity increases seagrass restoration success, ecosystem services, uh, ecosystem resistance and ecosystem resilience. Um, however, many of these studies have been conducted in temperate locations. 
And, uh, in these temperate locations, there's often a monoculture, so only one seagrass species. And therefore, um, the effects of seagrass species diversity um, are less known. And so there was one study that looked at the impact of seagrass species richness on plant survivorship in a restoration experiment. And you can see some of the results in this graph um, on the right. So on the x-axis is species richness and on the y-axis is survivorship and the plots with higher species richness had higher overall survivorship. However, less is known about how species richness impacts stability in established seagrass meadows. Um, and so in the Gulf of Mexico, we have multiple co-occurring seagrass species, and these include Halophila anglemanii, um, Halidulli ridei, and Syringodium filiforme, filiforme, which are um, pioneer or opportunistic seagrass species. And then there's also the Lassia testudinum, which is a more persistent seagrass species. And due to this variation in life history traits, we expect there to be variation in um, seagrass resilience. And we would expect the persistent, more slow growing species, the Lassia, to have a slower ability to recover. And based on these differences in seagrass resilience, you would expect that there would be increased ecosystem stability. So the uh, insurance hypothesis predicts that when there's um, asynchronous responses to disturbances, there would be increased ecosystem stability. And so if one species is um, severely impacted by a disturbance, other fast growing species could compensate for these losses and replace the severely impacted species. And so I wanted to know how response to grazing varies based on seagrass species. And I wanted to know how macrophyte species richness impacts resilience following disturbances. Um, and so I conducted a field experiment in Crystal River, Florida. And so in this video, you can see um, the seagrass meadow in Crystal River, Florida. And so this is a really dense and extens extensive seagrass meadow. And there's multiple co-occurring seagrass species. Um, and this includes the Thalassia testudinum is shown in the video with those wide leaves. And then you could also see narrower round leaves, which were Syringodium filiforme. And so um, I went out to Crystal River and I established 15 centimeter by 15 centimeter plots that varied in seagrass species identity and species richness. So I had plots that only contained one of the three dominant seagrass species, which are Thalassia, Syringodium, and Halidulli. And then I also had plots that contained two, three, or four um, macrophyte species. And so the additional species included are Halophila anglemanii and Calerpa prolifera, a macroalgae species. Um, and for each of these control plots, I paired it with a um, clipped plot that received a simulated grazing treatment. And these paired plots were located within 15 centimeters of each other. And I conducted a 12-week experiment where we would uh, travel to the experiment site every two weeks to monitor seagrass density. And we also applied the simulated grazing treatment every two weeks for the first eight weeks. And for the simulated grazing treatment, we clipped the seagrass two centimeters above the sediment surface to uh, uh, simulate green turtle grazing. And then for the last four weeks of the experiment, we stopped applying the grazing treatment in order to observe a longer term resilience. And at the end of the experiment, we also collected seagrass biomass cores. And so overall, we found that after the disturbance, plots with more species had better recovery. And this trend was strongest after the longer four week recovery period. Um, so here on the X axis, we have the average richness in the paired plots. And on the Y axis, we have the paired difference in density shown as a percent. So a value of negative 50 would mean that the clipped plot had 50% fewer plants than the control plot. And a value of 50 would mean that the clipped plot had 50% more plants than the control plot. And in this graph of week 12, um, the plots with more species, so plots that contained four different species, were recovering better than the plots with fewer species. And um, a polynomial relationship best fit this data, indicating that there might be a threshold in species richness. And after that threshold, um, species richness positively impacts recovery. Um, and when we looked at the paired difference in density after the two week recovery periods, we found that there was only a pattern in week four, where again, there's a positive relationship between species richness and the paired difference in density. Um, we also looked at changes in individual species throughout the experiment. And so we 
subtracted the initial density of the given species from the final density. And we looked at whether this change in density varied between the control and clipped plots. And we found that for um, the Lassia test studentum, the more uh, the longer lived species, the uh, clipped plots had a more negative reduction in density um, compared to the control plots. And then for Halidulia and Syringodium, we did not find any difference in the change in density based on the grazing treatment. Um, we also found that the amount of thalassia influences recovery from disturbances. And so here on the x-axis, we have the percent thalassia in the plot. So it's basically showing the dominance of thalassia. And then on the y-axis, we have the above ground biomass. And the, um, the color of the plot indicates the grazing treatment. And so most interestingly, we found an interaction between the percent thalassia and the grazing treatment. And so when the plots were dominated by thalassia, so close to 100% thalassia, there was a large reduction in biomass as a result of the grazing treatment. And then when the plants had um, lower proportions of thalassia, there was a smaller uh, reduction in biomass due to the grazing treatment. So this indicates that areas dominated by thalassia might be more severely impacted by disturbances. So overall, we found that species richness may increase seagrass resilience as plots with more species recovered macrophyte shoot density better than the plots with fewer species. And we also found that longer recovery periods might be important in order to identify um, patterns in resilience. And, we all, and finally, there might be a threshold in species richness after which there's a positive impact of species richness on resilience. We also found that grazing impacts the different seagrass species differently. And so the longer lived species, Thalassia, um, was more severely impacted by the disturbance with reduced density following the grazing. And so this is what we would expect based on life history traits, since this is a slower growing, more persistent species. And since the different seagrass species had different responses to the disturbances, um, this might be the mechanism that is driving the increased stability, um, which would be consistent with, with the insurance hypothesis. And these results indicate that planting and conserving diverse seagrass assemblages could provide a tool for managing seagrass beds and maintaining seagrass resilience. And now I'll discuss how seagrass species richness impacts herbivore feeding decisions and invertebrate community assemblages. So the diversity of foundation species um, alters the um, community of associated species and it alters ecosystem functions. So plant diversity can impact uh, plant herbivore interactions as diverse plants can be more resilient to grazing. And this is consistent with the results from the last project. Um, plant diversity can also impact feeding decisions. So a specialist herbivore might prefer to feed from a monoculture in order to maximize the food found per energy used, whereas a generalist herbivore might prefer to feed from a polyculture since diverse diets can increase herbivore fitness. Um, as this would help them maximize nutrient intake and minimize toxin up intake. Um, plant diversity can also alter the biomass and heterogeneity of the plants. So with higher diversity, there may be higher biomass and heterogeneity, which would lead to higher niche diver diversity and better protection from predators. So I hypothesize that more diverse seagrass areas would have um, more diverse invertebrate communities as well. And so I wanted to better understand how seagrass species richness impacts invertebrate density and diversity. And we used mesh bags to sample the invertebrate community seasonally within a single seagrass meadow. And so in this uh, photo, you can see um, a sample where we would collect the seagrass leaves and the invertebrate communities in these orange mesh bags. And then I also wanted to know how seagrass species richness impacts herbivore feeding decisions. And so I conducted feeding trials with the sea urchin Lidocinus variegatus and seagrass species that were offered individually as well as together in a mixed species assemblage. And so in these graphs, you can see um, the information we gathered on the invertebrate community. So on the x-axis is the season and on the y-axis is invertebrate diversity and abundance. And in gray are the um, samples that contain two seagrass species and in white the, are the samples with only one seagrass species. So in general, samples with two seagrass species had higher invertebrate diversity and abundance. 
And we also found that samples with two seagrass species had higher seagrass biomass, indicating that increases in biomass might be the mechanism driving these increases in seagrass diversity and abundance, since more biomass means better protection from predators for these small invertebrates. Um, and then we conducted both feeding rate and feeding choice trials using the sea urchins. And so in this graph here, um, we have the results from the feeding rate trials. And so the feeding rate in the feeding rate trials, the urchins were only offered one option and we measured how much was consumed in that trial. And so on the x-axis, you can see the different feeding rate trials we conducted. So there's ones with only Thalassia, only Syringodium, only Halidulae and one with a mixed species assemblage that contained all three species. And we found that um, there was no difference in um, sea urchin feeding rate based on these different trials. And then if we zoom in on this mixed species assemblage, we looked at the preference for the three different species that were included in the trial. And we found that the sea urchins preferred Thalassia and they um, avoided eating Syringodium. And we think that nutrient concentrations could be driving these preferences. Um, so we measured the carbon to nitrogen, carbon to phosphorus, and nitrogen to phosphorus ratios, and we found that Thalassia had the lowest carbon to nitrogen and carbon to phosphorus ratio, indicating that these plants are the most nutritious for the herbivores. Um, we also found that Syringodium had the highest nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, meaning it had the lowest concentration of phosphorus compared to nitrogen, and so therefore the um, herbivores might be preferring Thalassia, and avoiding syringodium because they're trying to maximize their nutritional intake. And then finally, we conducted two choice feeding trials where we compared the consumption of a mixed assemblage to the consumption of a single species. And we found that the sea urchins preferred the mixed species assemblage over both Halidulae and over syringodium, but we did not find any preference um, between Thalassia or the mixed species assemblage. And so this indicates that the mixed species assemblage is not deterring the herbivores, and they often even prefer this mixed species assemblage. And so overall, this project indicates that seagrass species richness could boost ecosystem functions as microhabitats with multiple seagrass species supported more abundant and diverse invertebrate communities. And these invertebrate communities are really important for the seagrass meadows because the Invertebrates include mesograzers that um, consume algae growing on seagrass leaves and growing in the water column. And this can increase the amount of light that's available for seagrasses for photosynthesis. And so therefore these invertebrates can dampen the negative impacts of nutrient additions on seagrasses. Um, and the invertebrates can also uh, connect the seagrass foundation species, the seagrasses to the higher trophic levels. And these results highlight the interconnectedness of biodiversity at multiple trophic levels. Um, and we also found that the mixed species assemblage provide a preferred or comparable food choice to a monoculture. So overall, um, these seagrass meadows with multiple species support um, a lot of invertebrates and diverse inver invertebrates, and they also provide an adequate food source for the sea urchins. And so, so far, um, we've found that warming temperatures, grazing history, and phosphorus availability will all make the seagrasses more vulnerable to herbivory. And plant herbivore interactions will also be changing as tropical herbivores um, increase in abundance in the northern Gulf of Mexico. However, we found that species richness could increase the stability and invertebrate communities in seagrass meadows. And so it's important that we consider these findings in conservation and restoration decisions since they can provide insight into future conditions in seagrass meadows and provide potential tools for increasing seagrass stability. Um, in addition, in order to effectively conserve and restore um, seagrass ecosystems, we also need informed and engaged citizens. And so now I'll talk about a project where it's trying to increase excitement about seagrasses in elementary school students. Um, and so I had three main objectives for this project. I wanted to increase the knowledge of a widespread coastal ecosystem in Florida. Um, I went to different elementary schools and I found that a lot of the students um, actually did not know what seagrasses are, even though Florida contains the two largest seagrass meadows in the continental United States. I also wanted to help students learn key topics that are linked to their state learning standards. And I wanted to increase excitement and curiosity be curiosity about science in order to increase science participation and engagement in the next generation. 
And so I led a 40 minute lesson at different after school science clubs in Gainesville. And so these included students that were ranging from third grade through seventh grade. And I began the lessons by going over different keywords that the students would need to learn. So these include um, terms like producers, carnivores, food webs, and ecosystem services. I also introduced sea grasses and sea urchins, and I discussed some of the ways that humans interact with seagrass meadows. Um, I helped the students visualize a seagrass meadow by playing a quick video of one, and I brought in a live sea urchin, and I let the students feed the sea urchin so they could visualize um, and see in person how the energy from the seagrass is being transferred to the sea urchins. And I also brought in smoked mullet dip and I shared it with the students and so that they could see that they're directly connected to these seagrass meadows. Um, and so for the first activity, I gave the students a blank handout and um, the handout contained the outline for a food web. And the students could um, fill in the different boxes using either cut out images or by drawing. Um, and there are also options for students to add arrows showing the direction of energy flow within this food web. And then I assigned each student a different organism from the seagrass food web, and I had them stand in a circle, and we all used yarn to um, show how your assigned organism is connected to the other assigned or organisms in the circle. And so this demonstrated the complexity of a natural ecosystem. And so overall, I found that the students enjoyed the activities and they reported learning new information. And I also gave a survey at the beginning of the lesson and at the end of the lesson. Um, so I could determine which topics the students were increasing their knowledge of and which topics the students might be struggling with. So I found that there was low improvement on topics related to the term producer. So students did not um, improve their understanding that seagrasses are producers, and they also did not um, improve their understanding that when the ocean gets warmer, the ecosystem can change. So uh, if there was more time, I would focus more on these topics when um, teaching this lesson. I also found that the students already knew that humans can hurt seagrasses, and they already knew that ecosystems include living and non-living parts. And then the students showed high improvement in a number of topics. So they learned that sea urchins are herbivores, that seagrasses get energy from the sun, that seagrass is found in the ocean and will die without ocean water, and that seagrass ecosystems provide benefits to humans, animals, and the environment. And so I was really excited about the improvement on this last topic since um, understanding ecosystem services is really important for understanding the importance of environmental conservation and restoration. And I also thought it was interesting that the students understood that seagrass gets energy from the sun. They just need to learn what the term producer means. And so overall, these um, lessons served as an effective model to help students learn more information about topics that are directly related to their learning standards. And these um, lessons can be used with a wide range of age groups, and they can be adapted for older students by focusing on trophic cascades or ecosystem services, and they can be adapted for younger students by comparing plants and animals. Um, and time permitting, it would be important to focus more on the term producers and focus more on interactions between humans and seagrass ecosystems. So in summary, we found that um, seagrass herbivore interactions will be changing under future environmental conditions. So warming temperatures, grazing by multiple herbivores, and phosphorus availability all impacted anti-herbivore defenses in seagrass, potentially making them more vulnerable to herbivory. I also found that the changing herbivore communities will likely alter plant herbivore interactions. Um, these tropical herbivores exhibited different, um, different feeding decisions and they also differently impacted the plants. So the plants, uh, changed more under the turtle graze treatment than under um, treatments that were mimicking other herbivores. Um, however, we found that uh, seagrass species richness could provide a tool for increasing seagrass restoration success, and it is also could be important to incorporate seagrass richness into monitoring programs since changes in um, species richness could indicate changes in ecosystem resilience and changes in ecosystem functions. And then finally, these seagrass-focused activities effectively increase student understandings of key learning standards.
So thank you all for joining and a huge thank you to my advisor, Dr. Reynolds and my entire committee, Drs. Altieri, Martin, Barry, and Osborne. Um, thank you to everyone who's helped with field work, lab work, and mesocosms. And I'm really grateful for research support from NCBS, Florida Sea Grant, Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation, and support from the Whitney Lab and the Gulf Specimen Marine Lab. And my PhD program was supported by SNRE, Soil, Water, and Ecosystem Sciences, CALS, and the UF Graduate School. So thank you all, and I can take any questions if there's time. Um, in the chat, someone asked, how long were the tolerance warming treatments? And so this was referring to the uh, mesocosm experiment. And so I applied a warming treatment for the whole experiment. And so that was four and a half weeks. And then I measured the tolerance traits um, at the conclusion of this experiment. So it was mainly looking at the resistance to the warming temperatures. Yes. I have a question about um, number three, which might just entail speculation on your part, but um, you mimicked a natural disturbance with the grazing. I'm curious if anyone has tried mimicking an anthropogenic disturbance, like a proxcar or anchoring, um, because I'm curious if in a mixed assemblage, that recovery would also go better like you saw. Yeah, um, that makes sense. I have not heard of anyone mimicking a prop scar, I think they occur naturally so frequently that it might be possible to find one and um, use a, a real one. But I would agree that I think with higher species richness, there would be better chance of recovery since you might have a higher likelihood of having those fast growing species already growing there and they can colonize the seagrass scar well, or the prop scar. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, someone asked regarding declines in seagrass productivity with temperature greater than 33 degrees Celsius, do seagrasses in the tropics have higher thresholds than those in Florida? Um, that's a really interesting question. And um, I'm not sure if I've seen uh, um, any work comparing the thresholds for seagrasses from multiple locations, um, but it would make sense since the seagrasses um, growing in the tropics would already be acclimated to higher temperatures. And the seagrasses in the tropics also receive more solar insulation. And so this can um, help them uh, maintain their productivity. Um, with warming temperatures, there's often a larger increase in the respiration rates compared to the photosynthesis rates. And this is one of the drivers of stress. So in the tropics, I would expect them to have higher photosynthesis rates and um, higher tolerance of high temperatures. Yeah. You, uh, oh, sorry. Can you, if you like, see this, like, so the Zoom people can hear you. Sorry, I didn't like about that earlier. But if you just press it and then the green button will go on and just keep pressing it while you're talking. Hmm. Yep. There you go. Uh, so, do you plan to build off of this uh, climate change and seagrass resilience work in your postdoc? Um, I. So I'm focusing on like science related to seagrass restoration. And so I think it would be in my postdoc, I'll focus on that. And so I do think it would be relevant to build off of the uh, work to look at how, um, how to best manage seagrasses for these future conditions and how to incorporate the resilience into the restoration. Um, and so I'll be specifically, um, I'm interested in looking at like priming the seagrasses to common disturbances. And so this may make them better adapted for um, these disturbances in the future. I have, I have one yes. question. Okay, I know we only have like a minute left. Okay. Um, so I just had a question about the curriculum that you put together um, for the elementary school kids. So is that something that you basically turned over to teachers and they're using that like in their classrooms now and adapting it or? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I have made the curriculum available on a website online, so it's accessible to anyone where it includes all of the handouts and the discussion questions. I also published it um, that includes all of the materials um, in a peer-reviewed journal. And then I've also given presentations 
for the scientists in every Florida school. I gave a presentation for the teacher professional development workshop. And so I um, introduced the teachers to this lesson that I designed. And I also um, suggested a lesson for uh, high school students that looks at how different factors might influence invertebrate communities and kind of helps them with topics related to biodiversity. And so that's um, one, one lesson that the teachers in the panhandle were really interested in. So I provided them with samples from our lab with um, invertebrate communities, and they were planning on making a um, lab for all of the high schools in their county to um, do that activity. Yeah. Okay, so I think that brings us right up to, to time and step over here so I can say a few things to Zoom people. So um, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Um, a very interesting presentation. So for people on Zoom and here that are enrolled in the seminar, if you have any questions for me as we're sort of getting to, you know, submitting final uh, grades and all those kinds of things, if you have any issues, please let me know. Um, otherwise, thank you all. This has been a great semester. Hopefully I see a lot of you next semester in the spring as well. Um, and yeah, that's it. But thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. that was so good. Um, I feel like